should I put this star? Just hang it on the top, Jim. Uh, uh. Give it to me. There you go. Wow, our tree is looking wonderful. It's not over yet. We have to hang these two. Give it to me. I'll hang that one. There are plenty in that box. Take one from there. Hello, kids. Uncle Francis, what took you so long? Look at our Christmas tree. It's almost ready. How is it looking, Uncle? It's stunning, Joan. Great work. Thank you, Uncle. Thank you, Uncle. Let me also join in decorating the tree. Where do you want me to hang these, Joan? Over there, Uncle. I think Santa Claus is going to be very impressed with our tree. Don't you think so, Uncle? <laughs> yes, I do, Jim. By the way, have you heard the story of the real Santa? What? Real Santa? No, I haven't. Wasn't it Saint Nicholas, Uncle? You are amazing, Joan. Yes, his name was Nicholas, and he lived a long time ago in a place called Asia Minor, which is part of Turkey now. Wow, Uncle. Uncle, can you please tell us the story of Saint Nicholas as we decorate this tree? That's a good idea, Jim. <laughs> of course I will. Now listen carefully. A long, long time ago, during the third century A.D., there lived a devout couple, Theophanes and Nona. They had been without a child for more than thirty years. And now, after years of prayers, they had been blessed with a son. Nicholas, we are going to call you Nicholas. Thank you, God. Thank you for giving us a son. Nicholas was a very clever child. And by the time he was five years old, he had started studying the Bible. Is he? Is he reading a Bible? Hmm, I think so. Nicholas. Father. It's pretty late now. You should go and get some sleep. Don't you have classes tomorrow? Let me finish reading this chapter, Father. I'll go to sleep then. All right, my son. But don't be late. I will, Mother. Nicholas's parents were very kind people, and they taught him to love God and everyone around. As a young boy, Nicholas loved to visit the nearby monastery, where his uncle was the abbot. It was here that Nicholas began his lifelong dedication to the church, as he joined in the daily worship, chanting prayers together with monks. Nicholas learned to love and serve God from his parents as well as the monks. Nicholas learned scriptures and theology as well from the monks. By the time he turned 16, Nicholas lost his parents to a plague. Mother! Father! Nicholas was left with a huge inheritance from his parents. But Nicholas decided to leave everything and went to live with his uncle and other monks at the monastery. He lived happily with his uncle at the monastery, where he continued to study, to grow in faith, and to love and serve God. One day, as he finished his prayers, he noticed a man talking to one of the monks. Hello? Hello, Nicholas. Who was that man who just left? He was looking very upset. Oh, that was Jonathan. He once was the richest man in town. Unfortunately, he lost everything. And he doesn't have any money left with him now. Oh, that's unfortunate. What was he talking to you about? 
He has three lovely daughters, Nicholas. He's worried that since he don't have any money to offer as dowry, his daughters might not get married ever. Poor Jonathan. Hmm. I'm worried too, Nicholas. No one in the town will marry his daughters without a dowry. I'm afraid his lovely daughters will eventually be sold into slavery. Oh no. Don't worry, Nicholas. God sees everything and he will help them for sure. Nicholas was very sorry for Jonathan and he decided to help the poor man. That night, Nicholas took some gold with him in a bag. Father, why are you looking so upset? Huh? I'm worried, my dears. I don't know what I have to do. Stop worrying, Father. God will help us. That's my only hope now. I hope he helps us quick. Sister, where should I hang these stockings? Hang it by the fireplace. It will dry by tomorrow morning. All right, sister. It's very late. Let's go to sleep now. Nicholas was standing outside the house, waiting for them to go to sleep. And when he saw that they had left the room, he tossed the bag containing gold through the window. The bag sailed through the open window, landing in a stocking left to dry. <laughs> Nicholas then left Jonathan's house, hoping that the gold would be found in the morning. Jonathan exploded with joy when he found the gold the next morning. <laughs> who, who would have left this gold? I don't know, Father. I found this bag inside the stocking this morning. It was none other than God. Thank you, God. You have indeed saved us. Nicholas! Nicholas! Huh? <sighs> Nicholas, did you hear about Jonathan? Jonathan? That poor man who we saw at the church yesterday? Yes, yes. What about him? Someone left a bag of gold at his house. No one knows who. And, and... Wow! And with that money, he's getting his daughter married next week. <laughs> That's wonderful! Yes, at least one of his daughter is lucky enough to get married. Don't worry, my friend. I'm sure God will help his other daughters as well. Hmm, I hope so, my friend. Not long after, another bag of gold appeared mysteriously. Jonathan got his second daughter married too. Jonathan was now very anxious to learn who was helping his family. From that day, he kept watch during the night. Nicholas, it's you! Huh? You were the one who were helping us. You have saved my daughters from a disaster. I don't know how to thank you. You must thank God alone for providing these gifts. This is the answer to your prayers to God. But please, please don't ever tell this to anyone. 
God bless you, Nicholas. You have such a kind and loving heart. God bless you, sir. But Jonathan went and told everyone how Nicholas helped him. The friends of the poor man were happy and praised Nicholas for his goodness and love. Nicholas wanted to dedicate his life to the service of God. He lived alone in Mira for a long time and became a priest. One day, it so happened that the bishop of Mira died. Nicholas was not aware of his death, and he, as usual, was walking toward the church for his morning prayers. It so happened that the previous night, an old bishop of Lycia had a dream. A voice told him in his dream that the first person to enter the church the next day by the name of Nicholas was to be named the new bishop. Huh? That voice? It must be God's voice that I heard. Michael! Michael! What is it, Master? I had a dream, Michael. There was this voice. The voice asked me to name the first person who enters church tomorrow by the name of Nicholas was to be named the Bishop of Myra. Is it true, Master? Yes, it was the voice of God. You must tell this to everyone. Go and tell this to everyone and ask them to make preparations for tomorrow. Yes, sure, Master. I'm going right away. The bishop shared his vision with others, and all of them prayed and waited at the doors of the church the next morning. Nicholas was unaware of what was happening, and he headed to the church for prayers as usual. Hey, Luke. Someone's coming. Who is that? I... I can't see. His head is covered. Huh? What's happening? I haven't seen these many people in the church at such an early hour. Can you see him now? Can you? No, the face is not clear yet. Ah, it's brother Nicholas. Yes, it's him. Son. Bishop. What is your name? I am Nicholas. <laughs> Praise to you, Lord. You are indeed great. Huh? What's going on? Nicholas, servant and friend of God, for your holiness, you shall be bishop of this place. Nicholas protested that he was not worthy to be named bishop. He said he was too young and inexperienced for such a great responsibility. But all the bishops said it was God's will for Nicholas to be the new bishop. Then they brought him into the church and placed him in the bishop's seat. Nicholas promised to bring the gospel of Christ to the people and defend the faith from all those who attacked it. After a few years, there was a great famine throughout Lyca. The crops had failed and every household struggled to find grains for their family. Why is our father so late today? I don't know, dear. Maybe it's taking too much time to find the food. Mm, I'm really hungry. I hope father brings some food today. Let's hope so, dear. Father! 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 
Hello there. Hey dear, did you get some grains? No dear. I only managed to get a few potatoes. That's all. Oh, we'll manage with the potatoes. Don't worry. Hmm. I heard that some ships loaded with grains has arrived at the harbor. It's loaded with thousands of sacks of grain. Are they giving any grain to our people? Not a chance. Many of our men and women went to the captain and begged them for some grain, but he refused. It's going to be all right, dear. I'm sure Bishop Nicholas will do something. That day, some ships loaded with sacks of grains had sailed into the harbor of Lyca. When Nicholas learned about this, he sent his messenger seeking help. Hmm. What did he say? He says the ships are headed for Constantinople, and that his masters had carefully weighed the cargo. He is refusing to give our people anything. We can't give up just like that. I'll go and meet the captain tomorrow. God, please help us. That's a good idea, Bishop. I'm sure God will never let you down. The next day, the good bishop met the captain of the ship. He asked the captain to sell some of the grain from each ship to relieve his people's sufferings. Trust me, my friend. You won't have to face any problem when you deliver this cargo. You cannot turn a blind eye to the sufferings of my people. But bishop, the Lord will be on your side if you help these people. I'm only asking for a few sacks from each ship. Please, please help my people, Captain. The captain could not ignore the words of the kind bishop, and he reluctantly agreed to unload 100 bushels of grain from each ship. Thank you, Captain. May God bless you. The bishop distributed the grain to everyone in Lycia, and no one was hungry after that. The grain lasted for two years until the famine ended. There was even enough grain left to provide seed for a good harvest. And back in Constantinople, the captain arrived with the cargo safely. When the examiners weighed the cargo, they found no shortage, and the captain was even congratulated for the great job. <laughs> Praise to you, Lord. Some years later, another ship was crossing the sea to Asia Minor when a terrible storm arose. Lower the sails! Lower the sails! It's the worst storm I have ever seen! We are going to die! Ah! Do not lose your hope! Let us all pray to God! It was a terrible storm, and the waves were so high that the ship took in a lot of water. The sails were torn to shreds, and the mast was swept away. Sorry for interrupting the video. I am here to deliver a quick message. If you think our channel has given you $5 worth of knowledge, then can you take a moment to make a donation? Please don't skip the video. 99.8% of our viewers simply skip this, or many think they will donate later and forget. If you make a small donation now, then we can keep making good videos like this one. You can choose to support us through Patreon or make a one-time donation through PayPal. The links are given in the description box below. If you are one of our rare donors, we warmly thank you. You have shown the world access to good content matters to you. Thanks again and God bless. Please save us, God. Do not worry. Listen to me, everyone. Huh? Who's that? 
I don't know. I haven't seen him in our ship before. Steer to the left. It looks like he knows what he is doing. Do as he says. Steer to the left. The crew obeyed this stranger's commands without knowing who he actually was. Head north. Did you hear him? Head north as he says. The captain and the crew sailed the ship as this stranger was telling them. This stranger guided the ship safely through the storm. Slowly, they could see the sun and the clouds disappeared. And finally, they reached Asia Minor. We made it! We made it! Ha ha ha! Yes, sir! We made it! Thank you, God! There is that stranger who helped us. It is he who we must thank for saving our lives. I can't find him here. Let me look for him in the lower decks. Captain! Captain! What happened? Did you find him? No, Captain. I searched the whole ship. I can't find him anywhere. I checked with our crew and everyone says they had never seen him before the storm happened. He... he has disappeared. What? How could that be? It's true, Captain. Nobody knows who he is and where he went. Hmm. Anyways, he did help us arrive safely in Asia Minor. We'll go to the local church in Myra today to thank God for saving us. The captain and the crew went to the cathedral in Myra to thank God for saving them from the storm. Bishop Nicholas was celebrating the Mass along with the local people. Captain, look! What happened? Look at the bishop! <laughs> oh my god! He was the stranger who guided our ship through the storm! Huh? But he's the bishop! Then how? The captain and the crew realized that it was a miracle. They fell on their knees and thanked the bishop for saving their lives. May God bless you. The bishop blessed them and spoke to them for some time. They remembered his words for the rest of their lives. And that's why sailors now have St. Nicholas as their patron saint. It was not just the sailors and the rich who got favors from Bishop Nicholas. The bishop was always kind to the poor and needy, and he always spread happiness interacting with the workers in the fields. It is such a beautiful day. While he was strolling in the fields one day, he saw a small boy carrying food and water, more than he was able to carry. Hello there. Huh? Bishop, I am carrying food and water for my family. That looks like more than you carry. Come on, let me help you. Give me the basket. But, but, you are the bishop. So what? Come on, give me the basket and I'll help you carry it to your family. Here, Bishop. All right. Now, where's your family working? Over there, Bishop. All right. Let's start walking then. That's my mother and that's my sister. And what about your father? Where is he? He... He... Bishop, that was so kind of you to help my son. Oh, that was nothing. By the way, I was asking him about his father. 
Where is he? My husband. They are going to kill him. What? What happened? It was the money lenders. We had borrowed money from the money lender, and when we couldn't pay them back in time, they took my husband away. Not just my husband. They took two other farmers too. But didn't you talk to the governor about this? The governor is taking side of the money lenders. Those rich men bribe the governor too, so that they can get the farmers killed and make an example out of them. That's ridiculous. Don't worry. I'll take care of this. The bishop got very angry when he came to know that innocent men were about to get killed. He hurried to the place of execution. But by the time he reached there, the executioner was about to kill the men. Stop it! Huh? Who is that? That? That's Bishop Nicholas. Oh, I think we are in serious trouble. Don't worry, we will take care of him. Jailer? Yes, Bishop. I am commanding you to release these men immediately. But, but the governor. Where is the governor? I am here, Bishop. How dare you give orders to execute these innocent men? What crime did they commit? They, 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 they have failed to repay the loans they took from us. That's why the governor gave us such an order. Are you the one who loaned the money? Y yes, Bishop. Do you know what God has in store for evil men like you? You are going to rot in hell. Even your family will have to suffer because of your evil deeds. You are going. That's enough. We are sorry. We are sorry for our mistakes. Please, Bishop. Please give us a chance to repent ourselves. We are sorry. We will never do this again. We don't want our money back. Seeing that these men were truly sorry, Nicholas decided to forgive them. Hmm. All right. You must forgive their debts and the debts of all farmers in Myra. Do you agree? Yes. That's very good. Now change your evil ways and follow the path of the Lord. May God bless you. Bishop Nicholas was known for his cool-headed nature, but it wasn't always so. In AD 325, Emperor Constantine convened the Council of Nicaea. More than 300 bishops came from all over the world to debate on the nature of the Holy Trinity. One day, it was the turn of Arius, bishop from Egypt, to speak about the Holy Trinity. He was arguing that Jesus, Son of God, was not equal to God the Father. How can Jesus be included in the Holy Trinity? He was just a son, and he cannot be equal to God the Father. Jesus was just a creation, just like everything else. Huh? What is this fool saying? Jesus therefore cannot be considered divine. As Arius continued vigorously, Nicholas became more and more agitated. Finally, he could no longer contain himself. That's enough! You fool! How dare you say that Jesus was not divine? Huh? Huh? Bishop Nicholas, what have you done? I know what I did. This fool should not be allowed to talk any more. How dare he speak like that about Jesus Christ? I'm ready to face any consequences for slapping this idiot. Bishop Nicholas, what were you thinking? I'm not sorry for what I did. You can give me any punishment that you feel like. Hmm. I'm sorry to say this, but this act of yours cannot be pardoned at all. We must strip you of your title as bishop. It was not just his title. 
they also stripped Nicholas of his bishop's garments. They then took the book of scriptures from him and then chained him. Then they put Bishop Nicholas in a prison till the final sentence was announced. God, did I do anything wrong? I know I shouldn't have lost my temper, but I just couldn't bear him talking about you like that. If you think I've done anything wrong, then please punish me. Then, suddenly, Jesus and Mary appeared before him. Nicholas. Huh? God? Huh? Mother Mary? Nicholas, why are you in jail? I... I'm here because of my love for you. The bishop couldn't believe his eyes when the chain fell off his hands. Then Jesus gave him a book of Gospels. Then Mother Mary gave him an omophorian, and Nicholas was again dressed as a bishop. <laughs> Jesus and Mother Mary disappeared after that, and Nicholas, who was now at peace, studied the scriptures for the rest of the night. When the jailer walked in the next day morning, he was surprised to see Nicholas in bishop's attire. What? How? How could this happen? Do not be afraid. Please go and inform Constantine about what you saw here. He will understand. Emperor! Emperor! Huh, huh, huh. What happened? Why are you running? Bishop Nicholas, he, he... He's no longer a bishop, Jailer. Don't you remember we stripped him off his clothes yesterday? He's back in his attire again. What? The chains have fallen off. And he, he, he's in his cell reading the scriptures. I can't believe it. Show me his cell. When the emperor arrived at the prison, he was surprised too. But now he realized the divinity of Bishop Nicholas and asked him for his forgiveness. Bishop Nicholas, I am so sorry. There is no need, emperor. I should have controlled my temper yesterday. We will fully reinstate you as the Bishop of Moira and we will draw a special creed with your views on the Holy Trinity. Thank you, Emperor. A special creed was drawn up, and to this day at the Mass we pray, I believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, and born of the Father before all ages, God of God. The name and fame of Bishop Nicholas had spread far and wide, one day, as the story goes, a wealthy man from Asia sent his two sons to Athens to be educated. He asked the boys to stop over at Myra and seek the blessings of Bishop Nicholas. The boys arrived at Myra at midnight. Huh, I'm very tired. We should get some rest now. Yes, let's find out if they have any place to stay. We'll go and meet the bishop tomorrow morning.
What is it? What do you want? Is this an inn? Yes, and this is a butcher shop as well. Tell me what you want quickly, or I'm going to cut you into pieces. We are here to find out if you have any place to stay for us tonight. We will pay you in gold. Ha, ah, of course. Pardon me for being rude to you before. It's just that these kids around here keeps playing pranks at my door. That's all right. We were looking for a place to stay so that we can visit the Archbishop tomorrow and be on our way back to Athens. Well, well, well. Why are you going to Athens? We are going there for our studies. Aha! You must be very rich if your parents are sending you to the Athens for studies. How does that concern you? Just tell us if you have any rooms available or not. If you don't have, then we will be on our way. I'm so sorry. Yes, of course. We do have plenty of rooms available here. You may choose any one you like. Now the innkeeper was a very wicked man. And when he saw the boys' jewelry and luggage, he decided to rob them and then murder them. When the boys were asleep, he slowly crept up to their room and killed them. To conceal his terrible deed, the cruel innkeeper then dumped their bodies in a pickling tub. He then took all their gold and other belongings. Hehehe, <laughs> now all their gold is mine and no one is ever going to know what happened. But the wicked innkeeper was wrong. The good Bishop Nicholas saw all his wrongdoings in his dream. He put on his pontifical robes, for he was an archbishop now, and took his crozier with him. He left immediately for the inn. Who is this at this hour? Archbishop, how? I mean, why are you here at this time? You greedy fool! Do you have any idea what you have done? What? I, I'm sorry. Forgive me, my lord. Please forgive me. Ha! <sighs> now show me where you have put their bodies. It's, it's in the pickling room. Come with me, sir. They... they are in that tub. Bishop Nicholas walked toward the tub and put his hands into it. He then said, And the boys were back alive. Ha ha ha! The boys recovered their possessions, and they resumed their journey rejoicing at their luck. St. Nicholas was regarded as the special protector of boys and students from that hour. Nicholas served as an archbishop and looked after his people for many more years. Everybody in Mira loved him so much. It is believed that as Nicholas came to the end of his life, he prayed that God would send his angels to receive his spirit. When Nicholas saw the angels coming down, he spoke the psalm. He gave up his spirit and died in the year of A.D. 343. Wow! That was such a wonderful story. Saint Nicholas will be my favorite saint ever. <laughs> That's wonderful, Jim. Uncle, are there any stories of miracles that took place after the saint's death? Of course, there are so many. Hmm, let me tell you one of the famous stories that took place after his death. After the death of Saint Nicholas, the people of Mira celebrated Nicholas's day every year. 
On that day, the children received presents, and even the beggars of the city also received food and clothes. On the evening of one such Nicholas's day, a certain family was celebrating and having a very happy time. <laughs> Go on, my child. Open one of the gift. Shall I? Yes, of course. But just as he was unwrapping the presents, two men came barging inside the room carrying swords. Father! Who? Who are you? What does it look like? Give us your youngest son and we will spare your lives. No, not my son. Do as I say, or this one is going to get killed. Now! The men snatched the boy from his family and took him on their shoulders. These wicked men rode to the harbor, and when they needed some money, they sold the boy to the king. The king liked this boy as he neither spoke nor understood his language. Meanwhile, the parents of the boy were sad and prayed to St. Nicholas every day. The next year, on the day of St. Nicholas, the family was once more gathered inside their house. This time there were no celebrations as they grieved the loss of their son. What's that noise outside? I will go and look. When the father opened the door, he was so happy to see his son standing outside the door. My son! You are here. Lord saved you, my son. But how did you come back? Who saved you? I don't know, father. I was standing next to the king just a few moments ago. That's when Saint Nicholas appeared and he took me from there. Father, mother, I came flying in air. <laughs> what? It's true, father. Nicholas carried me in air. Look, I even have the water jug still in my hand. Thank you, Saint Nicholas. Thank you for saving my child. Wow! Then how did Saint Nicholas become Santa Claus? Hmm, there are many stories behind it. I think it was carried from the tradition of Saint Nicholas leaving gifts at poor people's homes. Do you remember the story of the poor man and his three daughters? Oh yes, Saint Nicholas had left the gold in his stocking. Haha, <laughs> exactly. But there are many, many other versions for Santa Claus, too. That was a very good story, Uncle. Thank you, my dear. When do we celebrate the day of Saint Nicholas? We celebrate December 6th as the day of Saint Nicholas. And here is the prayer of this saint. Saint Nicholas, protector of those who sail at sea, pray for us. Saint Nicholas, defender of the true faith, Pray for us. Saint Nicholas, patron of the children around the world, pray for us. Saint Nicholas, secret giver of gifts, pray for us. Saints. Sorry for interrupting the video. I am here to deliver a quick message. If you think our channel has given you $5 worth of knowledge, then can you take a moment to make a donation? Please don't skip the video. 99.8% of our viewers simply skip this, or many think they will donate later and forget. 
If you make a small donation now, then we can keep making good videos like this one. You can choose to support us through Patreon or make a one-time donation through PayPal. The links are given in the description box below. If you are one of our rare donors, we warmly thank you. You have shown the world access to good content matters to you. Thanks again, and God bless. Following the ascent of Jesus to his throne in heaven, God fulfilled his promise that his beloved servants, known as saints, would perform greater works than Jesus to demonstrate his great love for humanity in incredible ways. This is the miracle of saints. Nicholas of Myra lived in the late 2nd to early 3rd century. That's a really, really long time ago. And it was obvious even from his birth that Nicholas was destined to live a life filled with wonder. Desiring to visit the land where Jesus lived, Nicholas made a decision one day to travel to the Holy Land. Planes hadn't been invented yet, so he had to settle for the old-fashioned way of traveling a long distance by boat. And here's the thing about sailing, it takes some time to get to your destination. Since he didn't have a portable gaming device, those hadn't been invented yet either, he spent the long voyage in prayer and worship, which was a better use of his time anyway. While he was praying, Nicholas was surprised when he foresaw a huge storm descending upon the modest boat. But he was even more surprised when the sailors laughed at his warning. There's not a cloud in the sky, they confidently replied. Well, their pride was quickly extinguished when, right at that very moment, black clouds surrounded them on all sides. Rolling waves tossed the ship about, and lightning flashed over the sail. Those men who laughed at Nicholas, yeah, they lost it. They dove for cover, plugging their ears and cried for their mother. Nicholas shook his head and smiled. He knew he didn't have to fear the storm like they did. He knew the God who commanded all storms. Don't be afraid, he called out to the others. He told them to take courage and trust in the Lord. Heading to the bow of the ship, Nicholas fell on his knees and began to pray. He prayed and prayed and prayed, while the others cried and cried and cried. As Nicholas prayed, the clouds miraculously lifted. The sea grew calm, and the sun shone bright over the amazed crew. They all jumped for joy and cheered, which wasn't a great idea for the sailor at the top of the mast. He fell with a crunch to the deck of the ship. It didn't look good. But that's when Nicholas did yet another astonishing act. With the power of prayer, the man was restored to full health. <laughs> A wind caught the sail, and the boat and its passengers arrived safely to the port. These are the marvelous works of God done through his beloved servants, the saints, so that God's greatness is made known across the universe. Mother Teresa was born on August 26, 1910. She was born in a little town called Skopje, which is in the modern-day Macedonia. Her father, Nicola, was a successful businessman, and her mother was Drana, a housewife. We are going to call you Agnes. Agnes, what a wonderful name. As a little girl, Agnes was a very disciplined, thoughtful little girl who didn't seem to mind helping her brother and sister. She was apparently shy and introverted as well. What do we have for lunch, Mom? We are having roast pork today. There you go. Just as you like it. 
and here is a special bread for you. Agnes! Yes, father. Haven't I told you before to not accept a mouthful unless it's shared with others? I'm sorry, father. You can have some of this bread, sister. It's really tasty. Thank you, Agnes. And here is one for you, brother. <laughs> Thank you, Agnes. You're always so kind. But the happiness didn't last for long. When Agnes was nine, her father got sick and he died. This left the entire burden of supporting the family on her mother. In spite of the difficulties, Jana ensured that her children attended the private elementary school and then the religious instruction at the Sacred Heart Church. Her mother's charitable nature, the daily prayers, the frequent visits to the church, which was next door, and the summer pilgrimage to Letnis, all these must have nurtured the desire to serve God in the mind of little Agnes. Hello, Agnes. Where have you been, Father? I haven't seen you for so long. <laughs> I had been to Calcutta, dear. Huh? Where is this Calcutta? It's in India. It's a very beautiful place. Hmm. Look, Father. I was able to raise some money from our people. Please take this. You can use it for your missionary work. Oh, that's so kind of you, Agnes. May God bless you. Father? Yes, Agnes. How can you know when the Lord is calling you into some location? Hmm, that's a very good question. I think you will know it by the happiness you feel. Ah. By the time Agnes turned 17, she sensed God's call upon her. She had just returned from a missionary work in Letnis, and by the time she reached back home, she knew what she had to do. Mother? Yes, dear? I have to tell you something. What is it? When Agnes told her mother of her intentions to become a nun, Durana went immediately into her room and stayed there for 24 hours. She was pouring her heart out to God. And when she finally came out of the room, her emotions were under control. Mother, what were you doing inside all this time? I, I was quite worried. Don't worry, dear. I had to let out all my feelings. This profession that you have chosen is going to take you away from me. Oh, mother. Don't worry, dear. Now you must. Put your hand in his hand and walk all the way with him. I will, Mother. Thank you so much. Agnes joined a Catholic order called the Sisters of Laredo, and she was going to India like she had always wanted. She left Skopje on 25th December, 1928. Goodbye, my child. What they didn't know was that they were never going to meet again in this life. Agnes formally became a novice in the Sisters of Laredo and took the name Maria Teresa. She initially worked in a hospital in Bengal and then worked as a teacher in a girls' school in Calcutta. Teacher! Yes, dear. I... I brought this for you. Well, thank you so much, dear. Teresa loved teaching from the start. She soon became the favorite of her students as well. Here, take this bread too. No, sister, you have eaten nothing. I know you're hungry. No, I'm not hungry at all. Do I look like I'm hungry? No, I don't want that. Hello there. Good afternoon, teacher. Good afternoon. Now tell me, why are you refusing to eat the food? That's... that's because... Go on, tell me. We don't have enough food at home. Our mother could only get two slices of bread today. And my sister? She wants me to eat both of them. She... I know she's hungry. But she won't have them. Oh, is it true, dear? Hmm. Yes, teacher. My brother is sick. And the other day, when the doctor came to check on him, I heard him saying that he has to eat three times a day. That's why I was offering him my share of food as well. 
That is so kind of you, my child. Now come with me. Eat well, my dears. Thank you, miss. Sister Teresa? Yes, Mother Superior. Come here for a moment. Yes. Why did you offer your food to these kids? They are going to make this a habit, you know. I don't know, Mother. Sometimes I feel we have a lot more privileges than we are supposed to have. Look at these kids. They don't have food to eat. And what are we doing about it? You should stop worrying about unwanted things, Teresa. I know, but I just can't stop thinking about it. It was not long after that Teresa found her real calling. She was aboard a train traveling to Darjeeling when Teresa clearly heard the call that transformed her life. Teresa's superiors were shocked when she told them of her intentions to leave the convent. However, they had much respect for Teresa and they got special permission allowing her to leave the convent. I don't think if that's the right thing to do, Teresa. We are worried about you. This is the God's will, Mother. I know what I have to do. Hmm. Anyway, whatever happens, you know the doors of this institution will be always open for you. Thank you, Mother. Teresa got trained in healthcare and she started her work in the poor slums of Calcutta. She realized that the first thing to do was to take care of their health. She started giving free medical treatments wherever she found them. But the money quickly ran out, and she was soon left with a few coins. Sister! Oh, hello there! How are you today? Sister, can you please help me? What happened, dear? What do you want? I haven't eaten anything since yesterday. Can you give me a few coins to buy some food? Of course, dear. Now come with me. Good evening, sister. What do you want? Good evening, sir. Can you give this boy some rice and curry? To this boy? Do you have any money? I... I... Don't worry. I will pay for his food. How much is it? But why do you want to help him? He is of no concern to you. He's a child of God, and that is definitely of my concern. Here you go. You have a great mind to help others, sister. May God bless you. Can you please make a donation, sister? Oh, hello! <laughs> Looks like that's all what I have. Do you have any money left for you? Oh, don't worry. A father will take care of me. Which order do you belong to, sister? I cannot recognize by the sari that you are wearing. I am Sister Teresa and I am a missionary. It's a pleasure to meet you, sister. I am Father Julian. You... You look like you're upset, sister. Is there some way that I can help you? Oh, it's just that I was thinking of ways for helping the poor. But don't worry, God will show me some way. Hmm, looks like it's going to be a tough road ahead. I know. Don't worry, sister. I will pray for you every day. And I will come to see you whenever possible. Good luck, sister. Thank you so much. She had no sources of medicine when she started, so she would walk down into a pharmacy with a list of medicines she needed. She would wait for hours till their customers were attended, and then she would present the list to the manager with a great smile. Good evening, sir. Good evening, sister. What can I do for you? How about doing something beautiful for God today? Huh? 
It was her pleasant and cheerful character that made many of the pharmacists give her the medicine she needed for free. Sister Teresa had to struggle a lot to find the money she needed. With whatever resources she had, she helped the poor tirelessly day and night. How are you feeling today? I'm feeling good, sister. Thank you for all what you did, sister. We don't know what we would have done if you weren't there to help us. I did what I had to do. It was nothing. Even the doctors were refusing to help us. They don't care about treating the poor. I would have lost my child if it weren't for you. Don't thank me. Thank God. Sister Teresa. Father Julian, how are you? It's so hard to find you, sister. One day you are in one place and the next you are gone. <laughs> I have to attend to many people's needs, father. I know. You have such a wonderful heart. And maybe that's why a friend of mine gave you this. What is this, father? Go on, open it and see for yourself. Ha! <laughs> a check? But how? Who gave this, father? <laughs> I spoke to one of my friend about your work and he's really impressed with what you are doing. He gave this money to help you with your charity works. Thank you, Father Julian. You have no idea how many people are going to get benefited from this money. Thank you so much. In February 1949, a former student of Sister Teresa named Shubashini, a Bengali girl from a prosperous family, joined her ministry. Good morning, Mother. Good morning. Hey, Subhashini. It's you? It's been such a long time. I'm doing good, Mother. How have you been? I'm doing all right by the grace of God. Tell me, why are you here? Sister, I have always wanted to help the poor and needy. I know that's my calling in this life. Can you please allow me to join your ministry? That's wonderful, dear. But are your parents okay with that? Yes, Mother. I have convinced them and they are fine now. Mm, then come with me, child. Like that, one by one, many joined the ministry of Teresa. By the end of the year, Sister Teresa's ministry had 10 members. All of them had the same motive, to serve the poorest of the poor in society. None of them received any payments for their services, and their sole personal wealth consisted of two saris, some personal belongings, and a prayer book. The disciples followed a disciplined way of life. They were up very early in the morning for prayer and mass. Then they had a simple breakfast of chapati and tea. They would be out in the slums by morning, servicing the needy. They returned for their meal, which again consisted of simple rice and dal curry. They would pray and rest for some time, and then again head back to work until evening. They prayed again before supper and more prayers after supper, and then they would go to sleep around 10 p.m. Sister Teresa, who was now called Mother Teresa by everyone, also charted a constitution for the new Society of the Missionaries of Charity. To fulfill our mission of compassion and love to the poorest of the poor, we go seeking out in towns and villages. We must search for the sick, the infirm, the lepers, the lost and the outcast. We must go and take care of them, offer them help, visit them often, awaken them to the love of greater God. The missionaries of charity expanded their work into more than 20 cities in India. By the 1960s, the world opened its doors to Mother Teresa. The Nobel Peace Prize was awarded to Mother Teresa in 1979. By then, the Missionaries of Charity had opened 61 new houses in 28 countries other than India. Look, 
She's not even wearing a shoes. Before beginning my speech today, I would like to invite all of you to pray. It is not enough to say I love God, but I do not love my neighbor. It is very important to realize that love, if it is really love, must hurt. I have never heard anyone talk about love that way. Look at her. She doesn't even have to utter a single word. Her presence is more than enough. And one day, Mother Teresa was invited to meet Pope John Paul II. Mother Teresa was filled with joy as she always wanted to meet the Pope for a very long time. Good morning, Mother. Good morning, my child. Has the Pope arrived? Yes, Mother. He's waiting for you over there. Let me go to him then. We have so much to discuss and so much work to do. Mother Teresa, you have become a very important public figure. <laughs> yes, winning the Nobel Prize means that the people appreciate my work. But you know, I am doing this only to glorify our God. I understand, Mother. I'm a big fan of yours too. And I'm happy that your fame is growing. <laughs> my fame can grow much more. It won't fit in such a small habit. Ha ha ha. I wish many people had your strength and your smile. This world would become a much better place. Thank you, Your Holiness. Mother Teresa breathed her last on 5th September 1997. She was granted a state funeral by the Indian government in gratitude for her services to the poor. And at the time of her death, Mother Teresa's missionaries of charity had over 4,000 sisters and an associated brotherhood of 300 members operating 610 missions in 123 countries. Wow! The missionary had grown so big! Yes, Joan. Uncle, what can you tell us about the miracles Mother Teresa had performed? Hmm. There were two miracles that were recognized by the Vatican that led the way to her sainthood. I will tell you about one of them. <laughs> In 1997, a tribal woman named Monica was diagnosed with a tumor in her stomach. There's nothing left to do now. I don't think we can find a cure for her. Oh no, please don't say like that. Please help her doctor. Please do something. Please be calm. It's an abdominal tumor and there's no way that we can save her. Oh God, what should I do now? Please save my wife. Hey. Yes, sister? Listen, I know about your wife's illness. There's nothing that the hospitals and the doctors can do now. That's what they just told me. Tell me what to do, sister. I'll do anything to save her. There's God who's looking after all of us. Why don't you take her to the missionaries of charity and pray for her cure? Huh? After having visited a number of hospitals and countless doctors, Monica was then admitted to a home run by the missionaries of charity in the town of Patiram. Don't worry, my child. We are witnessing the first death anniversary of Mother Teresa with prayers in the chapel. Be strong and pray to God. I'm sure he will help you. Thank you, sister. On September 5th, 1998, while others were praying in the chapel, Monica too joined the prayers lying on her bed. Lord my God, please help me. That's when she saw a beam of light emanating from the photograph of Mother Teresa. Huh? Huh? <laughs> in the evening, Two sisters of the order tied a medallion with Mother Teresa's picture around the waist of Monica. And then they prayed over her. 
After many months of uncontrollable pain and suffering, Monica was finally able to sleep peacefully that night. And when she woke up in the morning, her tumor was gone. <laughs> what? But how? It's a miracle. <laughs> Thank you, God. Wow, that was a great miracle. Yes, Jim, there were other miracles that took place too, which include the recovery of Marcelio Haddad, a Brazilian. Mother Teresa was canonized a saint in 2016 after verifying the miracles by the Vatican. That was a great story, Uncle. Thanks for telling us. It was my pleasure. Come on, it's getting late. Let's go back home. Thank you.